welcome everyone. So this is day four of our um, Tech Bootcamp and we've got um, a wonderful guest here with us, Matt, um, whose article you would have read, whose TED talk you would have watched as well. So Matt, uh, we're so happy you're joining us here today. Um, and we're gonna be talking about people and humans. Um, so it's all to you. <laughs> the floor right, is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. <clears throat> and I think this is, uh, I, I've always loved your work. Um, one of the really important things when you're thinking about people and technology is, is looking ahead to the future. So I'll just give a little bit of background about myself for everybody on the call, uh, the work that, that we're involved in. And today is not so much going to be necessarily about technology. It's going to be about the applications of a technology in a future state of our world. And by that, what I mean is, um, I very firmly believe that we are on the edge of, of our next evolution event as a species. And, and I believe the technology is going to play a very big role in that. And so for the last 16 years, I have been uh, working with technology to understand how technology understands human beings, understands people. Uh, and can it do it in a way that empowers us as human beings to uh, make a better world for all of us? to understand each other, understand ourselves, and understand ourselves in ways that we might not be so good at. Human beings are really good at applying and being creative, applying thought and being creative and, and, and looking for gaps. Machines are really good at pattern spotting. How do we combine those skill sets to create something magical for who we are? And what we're gonna talk about today is a little bit about how the brain works. And I'm gonna take you through a couple of exercises. I hope you find them fun. Um, and by the end of it, I hope it inspires some thought about how you can use technology in a way to understand how people are paying attention, what they're engaging with, with their emotions, how they are remembering things, what they think, and what they end up doing as an action. So that's what we're gonna walk through. We're gonna walk through it's uh, from the field of what's called neuroscience and the applications of things like machine learning, deep learning in the field of, of human biology. And I think it's a very fun area. So let's get started, shall we? So I don't know how to do a hands up on the, uh, on the Zoom call. But I think, I think, I think, I think, if you go into your menus on Zoom, you can actually access in the chat. It's through clicking participants, and then you can raise your hand. Yeah, so there you go. Okay. Cool. Reactions, yeah, and you could have a reaction, which could be a clap or a thumb up. So if you see Great. that, you could react like that. <laughs> so give me a thumbs up if you think the technology should determine humanity. Will I see it in the participants? Uh, you should be seeing it in the chat. So, or uh, guys, why don't you say uh, yes or no? If you if you agree, um, it's a yes. Uh, or if you disagree, it's a no. Match. There we go. I we got Jaden. Thank you. There we go. Okay, so I can see hands. It's perfect. All right. This is exciting. Cool, all right, now, <clears throat> hands up you think humanity should determine technology. Oh, a few more. I don't know if everybody's found the hands button. So should it be people determining technology or technology determining how people evolve? The first question. Hands up if you think that machines understand you better than people do. Perfect, thank you. Interesting. Our world is shifting in a very big way. Um, we're going from, and we have been for the last 30 to 40 years, going from a, a what, we, what we used to call a brick and mortar. So think buildings and very physical hard spaces to a digital space. Where technology is impacting humanity in a number of places is within media. 
where you start to see digital environments. How many here are on TikTok? Hands up if you are on TikTok or know what TikTok is. Only Jaden? I'm surprised that Jaden would be the only person on TikTok. These are all serious kids, Matt. They're all doing AI, no TikTok. <laughs> ah, but TikTok is built on AI. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> In fact, the magic to their algorithm is a very sophisticated read around both music and cultural preference. Uh, here you go. Ludovico says it sells children data to the Chinese government. So it does do that too. <laughs> These are intelligent kids who understand <laughs> what's happening with their data. So it's a wrong audience. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, how many people are on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn? Only two. Really? <laughs> are you guys not on social media? I think I've seen quite a few of you. Rachel, you too? what about Instagram? Is anyone using Instagram or Snapchat? Yeah. Mm. Uh, the reason why we need to get the hands working is because there's a little bit of an exercise later on around memory. So mm. I need to make sure that the hands are actually working properly. There we go. Got three. All right, let's do this as a test. Can everybody please hit their hand? That way we know it's actually working. <laughs> No, I just clapped. How do you raise your hand, everyone? You, you have to click on and the options. The option there. I usually just use the thumbs up button. Under reactions. Under reactions. That's what I. That's where I go under reactions. But it's only either thumbs up or. Um, the sort of annoying thing. Go into right participants, and then on the right hand side, there should be a lower and raise hand button. Mm hmm okay. Okay, all right, so the hands are mm -hmm. working. We got hands now, shall we try it again? I'll just load everyone's hands. All right, hands up, let's give it a go. See what we can do. Usually this is done in a live audience. <laughs> wow, 15 participants have raised their hands. Okay, I can yep. definitely be a, re uh, be a reporter and let you know how many. Perfect, are. all right, great. Okay, so um, so now lower the hands. I'm gonna ask again, how many people here? Hold on, uh, hold on. let me lower your hands first. Okay, yeah. done, ask a question. All right, so now how many people here have interacted or used social media in the last three months? That looks like a more realistic number, perfect. Okay, excellent. <clears throat> so in there again, media, before 2010, media was predominantly done through traditional television. Most of that stuff just didn't exist. Um, so we're changing, it, we're digitalizing our world. Um, how many people here have seen some of the advancements happening with doctor patient um, changes or, or use telehealth? Has anybody actually had a, an appointment with their doctor via their mobile phone in the last three months. Yeah. So the medical field is starting to get human interactions into a digital space. What about, uh, have, has anybody seen some of the um, facial recognition systems used by the police? How many people are exposed to that? Yeah. Lots of consideration there when you start using these types of things. How about autonomous vehicles? Who here has dabbled or explored what autonomous vehicles are? Lots of information there. You have to recognize the entire world and make decisions off of it. But also looking inward, you have to recognize when a driver is becoming fatigued because they're not fully autonomous quite yet. What about, uh, does anybody here have a smartwatch? Yeah. 
Does anybody here do most of their education online now? Mm. Yeah, we were having a really interesting conversation with the Singaporean government around how do you measure confusion with it within students, particularly because now you're online, the teacher doesn't actually know when you're stuck on a subject. And you might not know when you're stuck on a subject until you get tested. So how do we understand that? So these are the types of questions that are coming up in a future where we're highly plugged into our digital sphere. So I'm going to walk through today now how the brain works. So we can understand why do people do what they do. So technology today is really good at understanding what people did. And what I'm talking about there is the action that they took afterwards. And a lot of machine learning exercises are around taking that action and trying to predict the future from that action. The challenge with that is that some days you want ice cream and other days you don't. So it doesn't mean that every single time you want something sweet, you want ice cream. What it means is that you have a feeling of hunger. And once you have that feeling of hunger, that drives a particular action. So we need to put context around the action. Why and how do people do what they do? Our foundation is built off of seven years and 2.5 billion data points. We've measured 450,000 people over 89 countries. Um, to solve a lot of problems around how do machines recognize people. One of the really, really big issues was actually around race, which, which is what we've seen in the policing space. And that a lot of these algorithms were built in white Western countries and the training data didn't actually account for low light scenarios or low contrast scenarios, which happens in non-white countries. So one of the big issues that we had to solve early on in, in our phase was actually how do you address this? The other one is, does everybody smile the same? Who here thinks that everybody smiles the same? Everybody has the same smile. Yeah, predominantly you're right. Um, we don't, we're all individual and we're all unique. And when it starts to coming to measure emotions, it's not as binary as views and clicks and likes. All right. So, Anybody want to tell me what the top selling Halloween candy brand is? This particular study was done in the US, but it holds true to any markets that do Halloween. Anybody want to hazard a guess? And the answer can be figured out from the image. Is it candy corn? Candy corn is a great guess. Why did you guess candy corn? Oh, because it's in the picture and it's like it's more of an american food and like halloween it's uh hugely celebrated in america if you came to the uk no one does trick-or-treating like barely anyone does it so yeah and i i've just seen like i i like i've just seen it in like movies and stuff and you know a bunch of people like in videos yeah. they always use candy corn so yeah yeah and there is a reason why they use candy corn it's not candy corn though it's interesting but it is a very good guess, and you'll see why candy corn is very close to what the answer is. Anyone else want to ha hazard a guess? Three, two, one. Reese's Pieces. Oh. But for the same reason that you would think candy corn. Can anybody tell me why? I have no idea. I wouldn't guess Reese's Pieces in a million years. I thought yeah, it was so it's an interesting one. I thought it was going to be like Skittles or something. Yeah, so the, the reason why is because uh, simply the pumpkin is black and orange. And the branding of Reese's is black and orange. And it's the reason why candy corn is often up there. Because it's not the orange. So this is this is a just it was a very interesting study done. And this tended to trend up. Same with Christmas and Coca Cola, right? It's red and white, so you get higher sales of Coca Cola during Christmas, and it spikes during that time. So this is how the memory works. It starts to take in its environment and remember things, recall things at the point of purchase. So we're going to talk a little bit about how the brain works. We, we're, we're quite an interesting species, and we've continued to evolve from this little 
nugget, which is that reptilian brain of fight or flight or uh, freeze, and start to expand out to get emotional, to start to sort out different signals coming in, like, do I feel cold? Do I, do I feel happy? Do I feel sad? And then moving that into the rational brain. Now, what's really interesting here is that the brain processes, and it's, it's a major supercomputer, the brain, brain processes over 10 million data points a minute. Okay, sorry, 11, 11 million data points a minute, and, or a, a second. And what's really interesting about that is that um, only 40 of those data points per second go into the rational side of the brain. So you thinking, you in logic, only 40 megabits per second. Whereas the rest of it is done by your subconscious. So that's what's happening between your emotional and then your human brain, which then goes, okay, I've got all these feelings. I've got all this information about my environment. Now I'm going to make a decision. And that's what happens next. And that's the human brain where it decides how to act. But the emotions actually end up influencing mostly how it decides how to act. We have what we call primary emotions. And then we also have social and background emotions. Primary emotions are emotions that are reactive to the environment. They ingest what's happening in the environment from your sight, sound, smell, feel, taste. Uh, social emotions are more um, a, a feeling of uh, the event. So it's feeling awkward. It's feeling excited, high enjoyment. That's, that's more of the social side. And then the background emotions are things like... Um, uh, like mood, when, when you're saying, okay, I, I'm feeling a little bit down. That's type of a background emotion. What's interesting is, can anybody here tell me what emotion that is? Is that a surprise? Correct. Now, you recognize that as a human being, and yet... That's an ape. So what's interesting about the primary emotions is that they tend to stem across species. They're a little bit more universal. If you think about the chimp brain versus the human brain, you get this mix between the two. So when you start to think about applying this to computer vision, it's about how applicable and where it can be applied. Now we're gonna do a little bit of an experiment, okay? I'm going to flash an image on the screen for a second, and then I'm gonna ask you, it's gonna show a bunch of uh, objects and images, and then I'm gonna ask you which of the three images were actually on the screen, okay? Is everybody ready? Great. Can everybody see that? Yep. Great. Raise your hand if you saw it. So you make sure everything's working here. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Cool. Now, take the hands down. And I'm going to ask you to put your hand up if you saw a boat. Who saw a boat? Okay, it's only five people. There we go, a couple more. All right, hands down. Who saw a spider? Eleven people, 12. Oh, it's still going. <laughs> okay. And who saw the house? Six people. So yeah, so you notice how the spider was the one that caught your attention. That spider is speaking to your reptilian brain. As a species, when we grow up, spider was a big amount of danger to a baby. And so our mind saw spider and it elicited some fear. Fear is a good driver of memory. But what you've done in that is you've seen something, so you've paid attention to it. You've had an emotional response to it to allow it to go into your brain, to know that it has to create a memory, 
and you have now remembered the spider. So the interesting bit about emotions is that they kind of drive most of your decision making. Your rational thought puts rationality around it, but it's your emotions and your attention and the way you sense the environment around you is how you end up perceiving an experience. So what does that mean for technology? When we're starting to think about a technology before if we were to understand how somebody was feeling, we would go into an environment, we'd ask them, we'd say, hey, what's up? How are you feeling? Tell me how you feel. Tell me how your day is. And it would be on you to try and remember how your day is. And you would tell them if you didn't want to answer the question, really, yeah, it's fine. I'm nice. It's all good. Or you get into detail. Well, you know, I really had a frustrating day today and I was frustrated because of these reasons. But technology and particularly smart technology that has over 13 sensors on it, we can start to monitor people and observe people in a quantifiable way that can enable us to understand more about them. So we can see where they're looking on a screen using the webcam. We can use the webcam to understand whether they're expressing different things in their face. We can understand from their voice whether they're higher pitched or soft and slow and whether they're getting excited or aroused or not. We can look by what people write and at the speed that they write. On the touch front, we can understand by how hard they're actually typing. Anybody here think back about the last time you were maybe a little bit mad or angry and you were trying to write something and text it. What's interesting is people tend to push a lot harder on the keypad when they're doing that. So you can observe these types of metrics from people. Um, of course, you do this with consent. And of course, you give them the full power and control. And we'll, we'll, we'll give you the guidelines of, of how to do this. So now I'm going to show it to you in action, because this is how businesses use this. So businesses use this data to understand how people are voting, what they're watching, whether that is creating a memorable experience or not, whether students being confused, whether there's going to be a riot soon in a mob of people. How do we protect the safety of citizens? So. These are all the big types of big problems that we have to solve. And particularly when you're looking at the different industries that you're looking at, the challenges that you're looking at, realize that it doesn't have to come back strictly to what people thought after they did it. It can come into leading understandings of how are people actually feeling right now? And, and how might that impact the longer term effect of what we're trying to do? So it's always really good for user experience and design and understanding what we call the human experience. So now, before I do this, <clears throat> I'm going to switch in just so you have an understanding of what this looks like in practice. So what you're looking at here is a platform. So I would offer consent. And we're going to watch a video and see how I react to the video. Hi, this is me. First, we're going to do a calibration. So this is using machine learning and deep learning to be able to understand um, accurately within a pinky finger space where my eyes are looking on a screen. And given that we deliver a lot of content through a screen, like articles, videos, whatever it might be, games, we can understand what people are looking at. I pop in the age. Canada today. All right, and now here we're doing what we call a memory test. So this is a swipeable type of test if you're on a mobile phone. And it's, do you agree with that statement? So is Louis Vuitton cheap? Nope, they're definitely not cheap. Are they in fashion? Sure. Is Apple old? Nope, maybe. Is BBC Earth trustworthy? Sure. Apple stylish, sure. And we're actually measuring the speed of the memory plus whether you agree or disagree with the statement. So this is giving us a good measure on, well, McDonald's, I don't know about healthy, but maybe they are. Ready for this? And now we're entering an experience where we're actually looking, seeing where I look at and how my face oh is expressing my against this particular content piece of content. <laughs> This one has been living in there. So I apologize very, to anyone who's a little bit squeamish. Very long time. I'm not going to eat. I'm not going to 
the need to eat for a week after this. <laughs> Pound for pound, insects like these contain more protein than beef or fish. They're perfect survival food. Right, and then what we would do is we blend that with um, survey data, which gives you, it basically asks some questions around, how did you feel about it? What would you rate this content? How do you feel right now? So when we're asking, how do you feel right now? What we're actually asking is how you think you feel. So I feel a little bit disgusted by it. Whether you'd like it, recommend it, all that stuff. I'm gonna skip over to the, uh, in the interest of time, to the report so you can see what it looks like. So what you're looking at here is uh, over 150 people did this. And what we do is we take how they expressed on their face by the different emotions. So are they angry? What was their total expression in valence? We're gonna take those off. So what we see here is um, pretty much surprise and disgust. I guess how many people here were surprised at this particular video and what it was going to do? Just hands up. How many people here were disgusted? Me, 100%. Yeah. So, this is a good way to understand the environment. <clears throat> and now what we're going to do as say the video creator is I would need to say, did I hit my disgust criteria? Well, let's see. Ready for this? The heat map that you're seeing is actually uh, the eye tracking data across all those people. Oh my goodness. So they look at his face and then they look at the grub. This one has been living in there a very, very long time. I'm not going to eat. I'm not going to need to eat for a week after this. So right there is what we call the key moment. It's uh, and this key moment is is learned actually from the 2.5 billion data points we have as the main driver of a memorable event. So how many people got disgusted at this point in time? Yeah. This is, this is about it. <clears throat> and so that was entirely figured out by the algorithm. It was not put in by a human being. This was automatically determined. Whereas that actually ends up being the major Pound event, pounds, but the memorable event. Insects bit. like these contain more protein than beef or fish. They're perfect survival food. Yeah. So there you go. So that's how you can use biometric information to understand a lot more about how people are experiencing their lives or interacting with devices. And so I think the only thing that I want to leave you with is back to the guidelines. When emotions, how many people here think that emotions are very personal? Uh, I do. Yeah. They're an extremely, extremely personal piece of data. So when you are using emotional data, first of all, always, always, always give the control to the individual. So even if you're asked by whatever organization that you're solving a problem for to look at this technology, to get the advantage out of this technology, always separate the individual's personal information and always try and aggregate it in an anonymized way. So that's where providers like us can help you with that. <clears throat> um, but I think the bigger thing is, is that it's always do it under consent, make sure they know exactly what they're getting into and always give them the ability to delete whatever personally identifiable data that they have. So that is collected a face video to create that data output. Once the emotions are then created into a data output, it's hard to associate with an individual. So it becomes depersonalized in that I don't need to know who you are to know how you feel. I don't know many of you on the call, but if we were to be face to face and I saw you smiling, then I'd be able to understand that you were smiling with still not knowing who you are. From a business perspective, I can use this in aggregate and in a bigger database so that it's blended and people's identity are hidden. So the first thing always is though, give people the control first. Don't give it to the organization. Don't give it to the company. Give it to the individual first. The second bit is, Try not to make it determinative. So don't make happiness equal an outcome. 
that one's always a really hard bit. When people use algorithm, algorithms in a determinative way, when it determines the final output, it removes the human superpower of being able to interpret, contextualize the information that's coming in. So you want to empower human beings, you want to empower the individual, and you want to empower the decision maker to make a better decision. But emotions are not a binary type of data point. They have to be used in context. And then the final thing is always be open. So always be open with the people that you're working with, with your collaborators and people you do emotions with um, and share the emotional data with, be open with them about how it needs to be used so that they can get the best benefit out of it without compromising the privacy and security of an individual. And that is all I have for you today. Any questions? Amazing. So does anyone have any questions at all? So I have the first question, Matt, um, and this would be related uh, to the ethics. Uh, I mean, the emotion tracking tools are highly controversial and there have been has been so much stuff coming out in recent past how, you know, they can be abused or used for the wrong purposes or Pentagon wants to invest you know, to try and uh, track the emotions of potential, I don't know, non-allies or whatnot. So, you know, how does that make you feel? And where do you think this technology is heading right to? In which direction are we are we going with this technology um, because of the all the controversial stuff that's coming out? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> my view is very, very simple. Uh, we can either be stuck in an environment where technology automates the humanity out of people. Mm -hmm. um, so we become a binary rational being only, uh, which is going to stifle our innovation. It's going to stifle our uh, ability to adapt. Um, and, and frankly, it would just stifle us, stifle our evolution. So uh, emotion and facial recognition technologies are here to stay. Um, they need a lot of regulation around how they are implemented and used. That's, that's the real key point. Um, as far as, uh, it was actually very interesting because I've seen a lot of very, uh, what we call inflamed media articles around people are weaponizing emotional information. As someone who's built one of the leading emotional algorithms on the market, which outperforms some of the big technology providers already, I could tell you the technology is not there yet. Uh, it, it's not even close to being there yet. So that means that it, it's actually in the usability. It's in how people are using it. It's just like a vehicle is a car is the largest, one of the largest killers of human beings in the world, yet it still seems to be utility for us. Um, it's how you use it. So I think you have to be really careful with, with creating weaponized assumptions and doomsday scenarios um, before you actually understand the ins and outs of how this technology is used. If somebody used emotion recognition systems to say, try and predict criminal intent, okay? Or terrorist intent. Intent is the big one we've been asked to look at for, for the big government, government bodies. It turned down some of that work as well um, because it's not ready for that. And it's, not, it's actually not the right metric. Um, emotions are not even, in my, in my view, I haven't seen enough consistency on the emotional side to not require a human interference to be able to assess, is this data worth 100% of the decision or is it just an informing influential factor? And, uh, and, and I think that's really, that's really the direction you have to go when you're thinking about these technologies. Uh, but I think you, uh, the watchdogs out there will always push mm -hmm. to have this stuff stifled because it raises the question and it's a healthy conversation that needs to be had I personally informed the, the, the UK All Party par Parliamentary Group around regulation. Um, I also have an ebook that I can share with this group here uh, that goes into how you can build algorithms in a trainable and open and transferable way so that people know that it's being used appropriately. So uh, that's how we get around those types of issues. 
So talk to me about regulation then. Who would be regulating you and also who would be regulating uh, governments like China, for instance, who are using this technology not in a very, you know, pretty way, you know. Um, and there has been a lot of evidence how facial recognition has been used or surveillance has been used by the Chinese government to track um, certain populations in China. Um, so who would be regulating, um, you know, people who develop this technology, but also who use that technology not in great ways, like China, for instance, or who would be regulating somebody like you who is just developing this technology? Yeah, so I think, I mean, again, it's two sides, uh, right? So uh, I think your local government is your regulation. So in a case mm -hmm. like China, where the state is uh, implementing policies that are controversial to individuals, um, that's, that one's a little bit, there's no world order on that one. There's no world, just like there's no world order on the safety of automobiles. Um, so I, I, I think you, you have to, you have to separate the issues. Um, and, and I want to be, I want to be very clear on this one. A lot of what China is doing though, in the facial recognition, emotion recognition space, there are some very healthy benefits on some of the stuff that they're doing as well. Uh, not in the policing side, from my point of view, personally but mm -hmm. very much in the education side, um, helping, helping uh, um, high functioning autistic people being able to socialize, huge, huge benefit. Um, helping uh, individuals, uh, students, particularly in high classrooms, uh, 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 a lot of classrooms or not having the individual tutoring, be able to identify and isolate how they learn, huge. You couldn't learn that without putting these systems in place. Um, understanding, enabling psychologists to be able to track longitudinal psychology, psychological change, huge. We just don't have enough trained psychologists to do day-to-day -day monitoring of individuals to get proper treatment schedules in place. So this type of technology solves that. So in that sense, I think you have to be really careful about, again, inflamed statements around that stuff. So I, I would say to everybody here on the call, there's going to be people with a lot of opinions and a lot of decisions. Take an open mind to it. Really dig into the problem and understand what the actual problem is. So if it's an individual government, the government is, that's the whole point of the government, is that they've chosen a direction, they've chosen a path. And as a service supplier like us, you have to pick your spots. You have to choose who you work with. For us, we don't work in political campaigning and we don't work in gambling because it, emotional information can change the way that you motivate people. So if I'm gonna help a casino motivate people to lose more money, that's really not ethically, it, it, as, a, as my choice, it's not ethically what I wanna be doing. Um, and so those principles have to be baked into the organization. In terms of the UK, information commissioner's office, that's where you'll be, uh, that's, that's who will hold your feet to the fire. Mm -hmm. uh, we work closely with them to understand where, where we're at, and it's uh, guided by GDPR regulation or whatever comes out of the Brexit regulation capabilities. Yeah. So those, the, those are the areas, but I, I think you have to be really careful about making it binary. Emotions are not binary. The use of emotions are not binary. They're highly contextual. Uh, my, my biggest fail safe right now is if it's used in a determinative, determinative so if it decides automatically without human interference, then I think you've probably misapplied emotional data. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, does anyone else have any questions? So we have Ludovico um, asking who decides um, there would be no bias? Ah, bias is a good question. Yeah. Um, who decides the government's policies? Apology, I misread that. Somebody just. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, who decides the bias or the government's uh, policies? Who decides the government's policies? Ludovico is asking. Yeah, so right now, uh, it's again, it's uh, well, the information uh, commissioner's office in the UK is the enforcement agency of the government's policies. Uh, well, they 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 help make you call make calls on the regulation. Uh, Parliament uh, has a hand in that as well. There's a political uh, element there. Uh, both at the European level and at the UK level, but every national government, and even at, in some cases like in British Columbia, uh, the province I'm in in Canada has its own privacy policy for its citizens. So that'll be handled at the governmental level. Um, and uh, like I said, it's informed by industry experts, academics. Uh, uh, I, I think it could do better on the information side though. So 
I wish it was informed by my teens and AI, to be fair, because it's your future. We're talking of uh, teens and AI, so we have uh, 40 teenagers uh, who will be doing some really cool things um, next week, over the next couple of weeks. Um, what should they be mindful of as they're designing? If they were you know, planning to use facial recognition or emotion recognition, um, highly controversial. I remember there was a case last uh, time during COVID hack when one team of teenagers wanted to track emotion um, and focus in, in class. Um, they started um, asking the very friendly Twitter community about whether they are on track and whether this is a good idea. And obviously, as you can imagine, Matt, they were completely hammered um, and people have literally told them, like, don't do that. Uh, like, don't use facial people are scared. Kids. Um, yeah, so the team pivoted and decided to go with something completely, you know, entirely different. Um, what should they be mindful of when, you know, they're trying to tackle problems or, you know, using this kind of quite sophisticated technologies? Yeah, so uh, the three guidelines that I put out there, I think, uh, is your starting point. Always think of the end first and work your way back. Um, and that's not even just for emotion. That's pretty much for any problem. But, but understand how it's going to be used in the end and what intended use you're expecting out of it so that you can design in, let's call it the, the, the barrier principles so that people can't use it in the ways that you don't want it to be used. Um, and so you have to think like that. The other thing is uh, that I would, if I could suggest anything, I've been in this game for seven years. It has taken the industry seven years to even get comfortable with implementing this type of technology in a relatively safe way in advertising. So in advertising testing, if you get it wrong, nobody dies. It doesn't, it's not gonna fundamentally change it, your life. It's okay. So in the education space, um, I would argue, in fact, those those particular that particular group, I, I get in touch with me because fear drives a lot of public sentiment. But people are scared about what they don't know, mm -hmm. and this is not an easy topic. But if you dig in and solve the problem, you can convince a lot of people. You can make them comfortable. So the key is about education. The key is about communication, particularly in technologies like this about where you're going. And if your intention is true and it's fair and it's ethical, you can get the buy-in you need. You just, it, it takes some perseverance. So, so don't, don't be disheartened if you have an idea that, that critics are, will be there. As an entrepreneur, I can tell you right now, everybody's gonna critique everything you do. It's fine. In fact, when the critiques get louder, it probably tell my indicator that a, an opportunity is at a good state is that the critique is very loud. So the fact that people are trying to shut down emotion recognition tells me that it's got enough value and people are scared because they think that it hasn't been thought through enough in the general practice. So my view is go out there, challenge the status quo, make sure the intent is true and pure. And if that's the case, stick to your guns. Mm. So there is a very interesting discussion happening in the um, in the chat room. So Matt, you might want to have a look. Uh, so Mia has just made a statement. If the AI had no emotional intelligence, it would not be a good leader. Would you mm. think about? Oh, I, I can't. Where, where's the chat? Uh, there's chat. Ah, that's what, what I'm missing out on. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah. That is... Uh, Absolutely spot on. I mean, I think that's the issue. We've we've had to grow up. Our, our big technology titans right now are Amazon, Google, Facebook, Alibaba, uh, Apple, Microsoft. Their systems are built very much, and the reason why they're so dominant uh, in driving our, our kind of our world order is that their systems are built to be very easy to use and high scale, which means they kind of sit, um, uh, they, they kind of sit in the behavior side. So what did people do? Click based. Without empathy, I personally believe we're lost as a species. Empathy is what drives us to be creative. It's what drives us to look at the abstract. It, it, it's what drives us to invent. It's, it, it, it is what's going to drive us to solve conflict. Um, certain things just can't be rationalized. So I think empathy is important. Uh, yeah. And I think in my view, if you don't have empathy within the machine, if you don't know emotions, you don't know people. 
It's very simple. So if you're solving a problem that involves people, uh, you're, you're missing out on a very important aspect of what makes us human. Brilliant. Does anyone else have any other questions? Um, because we are coming to the end of this particular session. If anyone has a question, feel free to uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay, Charlize, why would you? Why don't you unmute yourself and ask that question? Um, hi. So I just wanted to ask. Um, it's I think it's scientifically proven that as humans go on with generations and generations, we're losing our sense of empathy. So do you think this will affect the evolution of AI itself and um, actually having humans in power? Ah, uh -huh. great question. Um, so I, I, you have to dig into the problem a little bit. Uh, why, why would we be losing touch uh, uh, with our empathetic side? And I think it's because we're becoming disconnected. Um, I actually think the interesting bit about technology is it's connecting us, but it's connecting us in a disconnected way. So even right now, we're not all in the same room, really having the atmospheric interaction with each other that we would normally have as human beings. And I think that's where we derive a lot of our empathy from. We travel a lot, or at least you know, our, our world is much more mobile. So uh, we're getting peppered with all kinds of small interactions of many people versus large interactions of uh, smaller groups of people. So empathy is one of those things that builds over time, in my view. And, uh, and yeah, I, I do think, uh, well, I don't know if it's proven that, that we lack empathy. I think the empathy is there, but it's like any other muscle. You have, to, you have to exercise it. So my view is that artificial intelligence in the emotion recognition space uh, helps us become more self-aware. I know it has for me. I, I was not very good at understanding when I was getting deep into a problem, I, I, I got really excited about it, but my excitement uh, just sometimes actually scared people off. That's, that's how excited I got about it. And some of you might know that feeling, um, but I know that it helped me become much more self-aware and by being self-aware, I was able to understand other people a lot better. And by doing that, uh, my role has entirely reversed from being someone who wasn't great at managing people, but it actually totally turned it around and I'm now able to uh, attract and, and I'm known for acquiring really top talent uh, specifically because they like working with us in the direction that I go. But it took a long time. It, it took a long time and it took digging into emotional space, which I knew nothing about seven years ago. So it took a long time to figure it out. I'm just hoping this technology helps people get there a lot faster so that if they have a conflict with their sibling, it'll help them understand first not just how their sibling was feeling, but how they were feeling. And if you can get a little bit of a read on that, it provides context to the problem that you didn't have before. So I think it'll make us more empathetic uh, again, but I think we're going through that dip right now where we're very disconnected through binary technology. Mm. Uh, so Rachel is asking whether the emotion quiz um, that you have, is it available to test? Oh, the, uh, the memory quiz. Mm. Yeah, that's a fun one. Yeah, I mean, I can make that available. It's no problem. Yeah. Cool. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? We seem to have Jaden who raised his hand. Um, Jaden, did you just forget to uh, lower your hand or do you actually have a question? <laughs> Probably not. All right. Um, okay, perfect. Well, yeah, uh, I forgot. That's okay. <laughs> That's all right. Okay. Well, unless someone has another question, uh, we will let uh, Matt go. Thank you, Matt, for such a fascinating presentation. And Thank you, everyone. Afterwards, um, have a safe uh, stay um, in Canada. Uh, don't break those rules. Let's make sure nobody. No, today's the last day. We're good. We're <laughs> yes. good. Oh, fantastic. Um, they let me out today. Um, but look, if anyone here has any questions, or if you're looking at solving a problem, one of the problems that you're looking at and you want to understand how to frame this in if you want to, get my email off of Elena. Yeah. Send me the question. I'm the product owner of the business. I own the company. Very, very happy to spend some time to help you figure it out because asking those questions is the only way we're going to solve this. And I just don't want our future generations to be stuck with 
what I have to do, which is what my generation was stuck with, which is click-based technology that boils me down as a human being into a one or a zero. I just, I don't like that. That's not a future I want to live in. So I'm going to need as much help as I can get. And if I can help at all, let me know. Perfect. No, I will definitely let you know. Uh, I'll let you know by WhatsApp and connect you if necessary. If um, if we do have any interest, um, you know, uh, with this technology or anyone wants to implement it, because there is, there are obviously lots of questions that will be raised, and you will be my first uh, port of call um, to ask you a question or connect you with the team that really wants to explore further. Thank you so much, Matt. And we are going to let, uh, let you go, and we do have another session coming. Thank you, Matt.